command of the country that they should. You know Jerry Coyne? Yes. From Chicago? He was yes. on this program not too long ago during a week-long series on uh, religion and God that we did. Uh, I want to play you a little clip from uh, an excerpt from one of those discussions we had. This is Dennis Lamoureux, who's from the University of Alberta in Western Canada, who says he is both religious and, like Jerry Coyne, an evolutionary biologist. And there are lots of them, yeah. Lots of them? Well, we have one of them on. Roll tape, please, Michael. Let's see. Uh, Dennis, you no doubt had to do this in the past, and I'm going to ask you to do it again, this notion of your worshipping at both altars, as it were. You're an evangelical Christian and a scientist. How do you yes. be both? How do I do both? As I, I basically, as I described, when I do science, I'm in the lab with, with Jerry, and we'll come away with the science. Now, if Jim wants to make a comment that sensible people, and please note the rhetoric in that, um, so there are many sensible people that uh, think God is behind the evolutionary process. So I think rhetoric like that isn't helpful. Um, philosophically, and indeed Jerry's right, it is a philosophical issue. I think it's an open discussion. Um, and so when I step away from the laboratory, I'm now playing, if you wish, another language game in terms of is God behind the process? And at the same time, if I make the statement God is not behind the process, remember that's not a scientific statement, but that indeed is a philosophical statement. Understood. So we're in the realm of philosophy here. Dennis Lamoureux from the University of Alberta. Why can't science and religion coexist? Listening to that clip, it had an air of desperation to me. I mean, here's a man who's been brought up as a child to believe that God did things. And now he's a, an educated scientist and he knows that evolution is true. And so he says, well, I do both. I go into the lab and I do my science and then I come out of my lab and I believe it. He then says something slightly contradictory, which is that he believes that God lies behind evolution. So he's bringing God back into the lab, which is a contradiction. Now he's saying God somehow maybe started evolution off. Maybe God helped the evolution over the difficult jumps or something of, of that sort. The whole point about evolution is that it explains things without the need for designers, without the need for magic, without the need for spells. If you take on board what Darwinian natural selection really does for human understanding, what it does is it explains how you get from primeval simplicity, which is easy to understand, just chemistry, how you get from there to the prodigies of complexity, which we see in ourselves, in trees, in, in wallabies, in all living things. In a stunning accomplishment of the human intellect, Darwin and his followers showed how something which looks as though it must require a designer doesn't. And that's a beautiful piece of explanation. It's a beautiful, uh, a wonderful, elegant achievement of the human intellect. Do you think that makes him... To, to suddenly go from that and say, oh, well, God was there too. That's superfluous, it's gratuitous, and I think fundamentally it's intellectually cowardly. Does it make him less of a scientist to say that? I honestly think it does, but I have to admit that there are some very good scientists who, on their days when they're doing science and thinking seriously about science, they do excellent science, and maybe he's one of them. There are lots of things in this universe that science cannot explain, right? Of course there are. Right. That's what science is all about. Science is about explaining what we as yet don't understand. So science is an ever-advancing process of looking for things we don't yet understand, embracing them as things as a challenge to work on, and then coming up with an explanation, or sometimes not. There may be some things which we shall never understand, but right. if there are things we'll never understand, don't run away with the idea that therefore religion does. Nothing does. Well, surely there are way more things in this universe that we don't know than what we do know. So they're all the more challenge to work on them. I, I don't expect to change your mind, obviously, but I'm well, wondering Well, no, why should you? I mean, uh, um, well, in the, in the same way you're the, trying to change I the mind of people who I read don't your think, book. I don't think you disagree with me. I mean, I think, I think that you're, you're, perhaps you're playing devil's advocate or something. But all I've done is to say science thrives on what we don't know because it works on what we don't know and it turns it into what we do know. You said there are thousands of things we don't know. I expect there are thousands of things we don't know. And I look forward to, um, I shan't be here, but, but science in general looks forward to centuries of conversion of those things from, the, from the, the pile of things that we don't know into the pile of things that we do know. But don't run away with the idea that if there are thousands of things we don't know, therefore religion does. That's the most extraordinary piece of illogicality.
What was your family's religion that you were born into? I suppose Anglican. I mean, my, my parents are not religious, but I was brought up in Anglican schools, and so I, 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 I had a pretty standard Anglican upbringing. Okay. Was there something, was there some kind of personal event that took place in your life where a light bulb went on and you realized religion just didn't have it? Not quite as sudden as a light bulb. I mean, I think it would be more um, over a period of months. Uh, I think when I finally realized the enormous elegance and power of, of Darwin's explanation for life, I think that probably was the nearest approach to a light bulb. Let's when say was that? About 15 or 16. Age 15 or 16? Age 15 so it's or a 16. Long, it's, been a, it's a long time that you've been at this atheism thing then, if I can put it that way. All my adult life. Hmm. And you've never had second thoughts? Well, what, how could one? I mean, the, I never had second thoughts about the particular God of the Jews and Christians. Um, I would be very ready to entertain second thoughts that there might be some sort of thing that I've never dreamed of. Uh, but w why would one have second thoughts about the particular God of the Jews and Christians any more than any other? Because uh, every time I've seen you interview, you are one of the most sure people I've ever seen. I'm, no, I'm not. I'm, well, I'm, 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 that's my impression. My impression okay. is you are absolutely in command of what you believe and what you don't believe. And, and I, I, oh, it I does not seem unjust. to... No, that's you unjust. You don't think that's right? Um, well, insofar as I'm very ready to change my mind if evidence comes along, it would be... The words you've just uttered would be appropriate to somebody who has uh, faith which can never be changed. And there are some. I mean, there are people who said... I mean, I've quoted one in The God Delusion. Um, somebody who said that if all the evidence in the world was against what I believe in, which happened to be creationism, I would still be a creationist because that is what the scriptures say. Now, that really is unshakable uh, belief. I'm not unshakable. You could shake me with evidence any, any day you like if you could find any.